Today's sponsor is Ava. Did you start trying for a baby thinking that ovulation was your one and only chance each cycle? It's not. In fact, there are six days a cycle when it's possible to conceive, the five leading up to ovulation and the day of ovulation itself. So how can you make use of that fertile window when you don't even know you're in it? That is when AVA comes in. AVA is a sensor bracelet that detects subtle changes in your vital signs that correspond with the opening and closing of the fertile window. All you have to do is wear AVA while you sleep and sync to the app in the morning to see five of those fertile days as they're happening. And right now, it is $20 off for the Sisters and Lost listeners. Just use the code AVASisters at avawoman.com. Once again, use the code AVASisters or A-V-A-S-I-S-T-E-R-S at avawoman.com. Well, welcome, Shirley, to the podcast. Thank you. I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself and what you do. So I'm Shirley. I am a school nurse for a charter school in Brockton. Yes. So take us back on your journey to motherhood and share with us your love story. So I found out I was pregnant with my daughter Sarai in September. I was not, she was not planned. I was surprised, shocked but I was excited. So I had some little palpitations and things in the pregnancy like I did with my other two pregnancies, but I kept being assured that she was fine. There was nothing to worry about. Cravens weren't really, I didn't really have cravens like that. But the funny thing is, is that I could not eat meat again. I'm not sure what it was about meat. I just couldn't take it. So um, that was a little bit of a hard thing to deal with, um, with not being able to eat properly. And then things, you know, kept progressing on in the pregnancy. And February 1st, 2020, I had gotten home from work and I realized that I didn't feel her moving. And I feel her moving and I was like, wait, maybe she's asleep. And I'm like, okay, I'm 25 weeks. Um, Nothing is really, excuse me, nothing is really wrong because I had just saw someone a week before my OB. So let me, and I did have blood work done the week before. And I was like, maybe I should go and, you know, repeat it today since it was, I did need to repeat it. So I said, well, since I'm going to be off today, let me just go on to the lab. So I um, drove to the lab and then in the elevator, I'm still like, I still didn't feel her move. And I live an hour away from the hospital. So I'm like, okay, this isn't normal. So I never went to the lab. I just went into labor and delivery and um, I was taken in right away. Um, I thought my water was leaking. Um, They, you know, confirmed the nurses confirmed that this did not happen. And of course I was hooked up to the, the monitor. When I looked at the monitor, I noticed that her heart rate was good. It was 152, but I noticed that she didn't have any variability in the fetal monitor. And the nurse, you know, she did ask me, she was like, do you know how to read that? And I said, yes, there's no variability. Can you give me something cold to drink? Because I knew what the next, can you just give me something cold to drink? Um, So she definitely got me a cold ginger ale and still nothing. So she moved me into the the laboring room because she wanted to do a bedside ultrasound. So one of my high-risk providers um, was there. I didn't even notice that she was there. Um, She came in and she did the bedside ultrasound and she froze in place. She stopped, she leaves out of the room. And I'm like, okay, why is she leaving out the room? Something's bad has happened. Another doctor comes in and she looks and her eyes got really big and she said, oh my God. And I'm like, okay, then they both leave and it's just me and the nurse Tiffany. Um, Then 
another doctor comes in and multiple other providers come in behind her, uh, which meant to me that she was somebody very important at that hospital. So she did a, a bedside ultrasound and then she turned it off um, and she sat at the foot of my bed and she said, um, so your baby has had a stroke and she has a massive bleed on her brain. And that's, I don't remember anything else. I remember screaming, um, but hearing my own screams and cries, um, it's a lot to take in. And I do not remember much after that. Um, I had contacted family and friends. I also worked for DM for one of the a clinic in Massachusetts and three of the providers and my manager actually came to the hospital to support me um, the next day. I had to go for a, an MRI for the baby. Her name was Sarai. I had to go for um, an MRI and the tech showed me an iPad of the baby scan. And she said, oh, here's your baby. And I could see the bleed, I can see. And I knew that chances for survival with her was, was slim to none. Um, and then I felt something reassuring. I felt that, I felt my baby move. I felt her move. So I was so excited, like, okay, maybe actually she's fighting, you know? So then um, I get back upstairs and the doctor, the doctor was in the room. And I just wasn't sure why she was in there. And she said, well, the text said that she got amazing views of the baby's heart. And I said, well, you can't get amazing views of a beating heart. That's impossible. And she just said, I just need to check something. And she checked, um, she did an ultrasound and informed me um, and my husband that um, our daughter had passed away. And it was very devastating. I still don't um, really remember much because I was, you know, the, the horror of it. And um, I went into, you know, I started the process of labor that evening and it was awful. Um, I, I just, I didn't want to give birth because I just wanted to hold on to her just a little bit longer. Um, but going through the process and I didn't think that I would have been in so much pain because I was 25 weeks, but it's literally, it's full labor. Um, and a long time, you know, did pass and I did need pain medication. And then I discovered I have of an allergy to this medication because I suffered respiratory depression. Um, so my life was on the line. And then, um, you know, when I had her, everything is quiet. And, you know, the, the, the silence is so loud. It's so loud. And though I wasn't alone, it felt, so, it felt very isolating but I was able to hold to my baby. I was able to kiss her, to tell her my, how much I loved her. Um, the nurses and doctors, they were so nice. They cried with me. They hugged me. They, they stayed with me a while. They took pictures, um, her footprints, and there was like a little box and everything. Um, it was just amazing. Um, and then, you're left with planning services for your baby. And if it wasn't for my cousin, I wouldn't have known what to do. She really, I told her, I said, I, I need your help on this. So she was able to call around a few funeral homes for me. We settled on one and the state pays for I believe still burst like a cremation because I wanted to have her cremated. So they were able to do that um, at no cost, but you did have to pay if you wanted to view the cremation. And I did. And that's when I got 
another blow. I didn't realize that I, I didn't realize that I wasn't going to be able to see her um, anymore. Apparently, they don't embalm babies that young, so I wasn't going to be able to see her. I, I, and I, I wasn't ready for that. I thought I was going to be able to see her one last time, but I could have, but I didn't want that to be my last vision of her. So I couldn't, I couldn't. So the process was, it was sad. And my aunt's uncle and my best friend and my cousin, they took care of me. The funeral home was nice enough to put her, you know, ashes and everything for me. And they were the whole step of the way um, with them calling me to check, you know, to even check in on me um, was very, it was very thoughtful. Yeah, because normally funeral homes don't do that. So thank God that you had a funeral home who had enough, you know, um, empathy and compassion to be able to do that. And um, thank God for your the state to do that, because a lot of families um, end up having this other cost on top of the cost for the hospital bills, right. you know, to um, actually do a funeral or do cremation or anything. Mm-hmm. So I'm so happy that you were able to have that portion of it. And one thing that I think now that's different in a lot of hospitals are having the ability with a cuddle cot or a can cradle that will preserve the bodies of babies, um, you know, no matter what gestation. And then it does give you just that little bit more time to have with the babies before you have to give them over. Yeah. Um, So now they're making that way, um, which does help out for those who have untimely losses, um, like we both experienced. So tell me how did those next few weeks go, you know, how did you really go through that grieving process? I mean, because obviously, you know, even at 25 weeks, were you able to take time off of work? Really take us through that process. I wasn't a school nurse at that time. So I was still working at one a family medicine clinic. So the blessing with that is, is that number one, I had already paid into short-term disability. Massachusetts for their, their hospitals, um, they were not really big on, you can take your maternity leave, but not to be paid for it unless you put into some form of disability, 401k, something like that. Um, and I was, I had already had that in place for me. And my manager told me before I left the hospital, she said, you know, while we're sitting here, call your therapist. I had already saw a therapist while I was in nursing school, just on an event too. And she was like, I think that you should reach out to your therapist right now to let her know what's happening. And you're going to need a lot of support right now. So that's what I did. Um, I went into therapy. I still am in therapy a year later, bi-weekly now, and which that has sincerely helped. I was able to be off of work, my full maternity leave. Um, at three months. And even going back to work, everyone there was supportive. Um, Because they I was at work and I was pregnant. So they knew like, oh, don't even go near her with that chicken. Don't go near her with any of the meats because she's going to be in here sick. So, you know, they were very warm to that. And when I heard they they did too they were upset as well but they were there to support me they sent me text messages called me emails everything just to check in and see how I'm doing just to say that they were thinking about me so it was a blessing that I was able to have my full maternity leave yes it was because um not many people get that um at all (laughs) So thank God for that. And thank God for going back with therapy and being in therapy, Uh, therapy, you know, we are a huge advocate for therapy here 
um, and having a mental health professional, someone who's unbiased to really sort through our feelings um, as we go through the grief, but even beyond the grief as we transition and the different um, ups and downs of life, especially now as we've all gone through some form of collective grief and loss through COVID-19 and having the coronavirus hit our country so hard, or really the whole world, ain't just the U.S., right? Right. Um, I would love for you to share with us how your next steps, you know, how did you move forward with, you know, your faith, um, your walk in that journey and how um, did it impact your relationships? So uh, my faith, I lost my faith for a very long time. Um, I was just Mostly like, why would God do this to me? What did I do to deserve this type of pain? But one of a very, very good friend of mine, um, no matter what time of day I called, they would pick up. My friends, they would all pick up. And I had to look at my children. I didn't want to get out of bed. And I was asked by a friend, a very simple question. It was a very tough question to hear. And that was, do you want to be like this? I wasn't getting out of bed. I wasn't eating. Uh, um, I would get up to shower and I would go right back in the bed. I would see my kids and they would just see me in the bed. I didn't smile, I didn't laugh. I just cried all the time and I didn't want them to see me like that anymore. I didn't want them to feel like I missed all this time because I was so busy in my grief and consumed with my grief that yes, they lost a sister, but now they have to lose their mom. So I had to think about that and time will still go by. She'll never, I'll never forget Saran. I'll never forget her. And she is always with me in my relationships. My marriage suffered, my marriage ended um, behind it. And it, it hurts, it does, but I'm able to actually grieve my daughter. Everyone grieves differently. My husband never wanted to talk about it, but I did. And he was very standoffish with it because it hurt. I wanted to talk about it because it hurt. We just grieve differently. And sometimes grief can tear things apart. But I feel like with the grief, I got closer to my children. I did get closer to my living children. Yes. And I, I really feel like, um, and that's the reason why I asked about relationships, because obviously I feel like all of our relationships, whether they are, you know, romantic or, you know, our friendships or even our familiar relationships are impacted by our loss. And um, I don't, I didn't really, you know, it's been nine years since my first loss and I didn't realize how much of an impact it had on just my familiar relationships. Obviously my romantic relationship, I knew, you know, cause that's day to day, but like my grandparents and my parents and my sisters and how much they still are grieving as well. And so I can imagine how it has made you lean in more closely to, you know, the children that you have here. Today's sponsor is Ava Woman. Did you start trying for a baby thinking that ovulation day was your one and only chance each cycle? It's not. In fact, there are six days a cycle when it's possible to conceive the five leading up to ovulation, and the day of ovulation itself. So how can you make use of that full fertile window when you don't even know you're in it? This is where Ava comes in. It's a sensor bracelet that detects subtle changes in your vital signs that correspond with the opening and closing of the fertile window. 
All you have to do is wear Ava while you sleep and sync the app in the morning to see five of those fertile days as they're happening. Ava is better than other methods because LH test can only tell you one or two fertile days. Taking your temperature only lets you know after you've ovulated, so it's not helpful in real time. And period tracker apps only guesstimate your fertility based on genetic averages. Plus, Ava's technology has been clearly tested and cleared by the FDA. So if you're trying to get pregnant, remember, you've got more than just ovulation day to play with. Let Ava tell you your best five days to conceive. And right now, it is $20 off for Sisters and Lost listeners. Just use the code AVASisters at avawomen.com. That is A-V-A-S-I-S-T-E-R-S, AVASisters at avawomen.com. Um, so how, what are some other ways you've parent differently after your loss that you can share? Because a lot of people may, like you said, it's just hard to, to get out of bed, to put your shoes on, to even go to work sometimes because you have this fog over you, but you know you have to do it because you have these other children to take care of and you still have to show up to be mommy to them. So how have you navigated parenthood differently um, since your loss? So I live more in the now, like playing games on a Tuesday night, letting them have a little bit more marshmallows in their hot chocolate, letting them stay up for five extra minutes. My children lucked out, I feel like, when it comes to me. And if I'm driving by, oh, mommy, I want some McDonald's. Okay, well, I can use a fry or two. You know, they, they lucked out, um, but just those little moments, let's just stop for friends. Those little moments, I actually cherish them more and I talk with my children more and I feel like the loss and the pandemic actually really showed me how mature my children are. Um, my son is 13 um, and my daughter is seven and I was still coddling both of them, like, oh my goodness, they can't do anything. But actually they can, they're a lot more wiser. So they're able to verbalize things that they want to do, things that are boring. I'm able to let them speak more freely. They were able to speak freely before, but they were a little bit keen on saying something that they didn't like. Like for instance, we went to go see the light show at the football stadium that's here in Massachusetts and my seven-year-old she didn't like it and I took it as she didn't like it I didn't internalize it my 13 year old loved it which is funny I loved it but then my daughter did say it would have been better if we had some hot chocolate just taking though that's that's all she wanted was the hot chocolate but just taking really smaller moments and sitting down with them, you'll be really surprised about what they say. You'll be really surprised about what they say. And they write Sarai, they write her little notes when they're thinking about her. That's amazing and heartwarming to me. I have been way more patient and way more, I guess, sort of kind of like a cool mom. I don't have to be so stern all the time. It's okay. It's okay because we all know in one moment, things can go very wrong and just have to live in the moment and not think, well, if you don't do this now, this will happen. No, wait a minute. Not everything has to go according to plan all the time. So I live more than now. 
I love that. I love that you are creating memories now. And I think that obviously grief shows up that way for us, but also I feel like this pandemic has shown up that way for us as yes. you know, we've seen so many people, our, our loved ones, our friends, our associates who've experienced these untimely losses of, you know, adults or, you know, just friends throughout um, COVID-19 and in 2020. And as we're in 2021, I think that been in that quality time and creating memories is so important. And I'm so happy that you um, have done that both collectively as you're grieving and as COVID has made us stay at home and spend more time with our, our loved ones and live in the now and in the present. One thing that I, I love that you said is that your kids are writing memories and in notes to Sarai and honoring her that way. So what are some other ways do you think you're going to honor her as the year goes on? So again, culturally, um, and we grieve differently, I didn't get a chance to put her ornament on the Christmas tree. So I'm going to get a Christmas tree. Yes, it's February, but I want that Christmas tree. And I want to put her ornament on the Christmas tree. And that's what I'm going to do. It was her birthday on the 3rd, um, February 3rd. So um, the kids and I just said just words that we missed her and how we felt and how the year has passed by and what the kids were really, really thinking of. They're like, is she, you think that she's walking by now in heaven or you think that she's still crawling? Do you think, yeah, like, do you think that, how many teeth do you think that she has? Um, does she, you know, it's just what she would have been doing. And oh, I love um, that. that brings tears yeah, to my eyes to think yeah. that they are thinking of what that, what their little sister would be doing if she yeah. was here, here on earth in heaven, yeah. um, playing with all the other kids who never yeah. to heaven far too soon. Oh, oh, that, yeah. really, oh that just touches my heart. So that, yeah. So it, it made me think that she's not forgotten with him either. No, oh. I love that. I absolutely love that. That brings tears to my eyes too, to think that. And, and it goes to just how, you know, mature your kids are and how in tune with their feelings are they are as well, how they're able to express that to you. I think that not a lot of kids, um, definitely not at seven um, and 13, you know, going into those teenage years are able to articulate it in that manner. So kudos to you, mom, for doing the work and being able to pour back into your your kids because they're a reflection of you and the hard work that you've been doing in therapy and working through your grief. But that just brings, oh, that just brings me so much joy to know that they are able to share in that and, and celebrate and honor her in that way, because I know that really bring some comfort to you. It's probably very cathartic for you as well to hear your kids say that. Yes. Um, but it's also your way of honoring her. And I love that you all are going to do more things to honor and center her, um, not just in Christmas, but really throughout the year as yes. you want her to be, a, she is a part of your family, even though she isn't in the physical. So I, oh, Oh, that touches my heart. Thank you for sharing that, Shirley. I think that this will be so beneficial to a lot of other families who've had, who have older children and really trying to figure out how to honor their babies throughout the year that are in heaven. Um, So lastly, I would love for you to just really leave us some encouraging words as you have navigated this journey of grief over this last year. What encouraging words can you leave with our listeners, those who are in the the fog of it, you know, and those who are climbing and getting over the hill, and then those who may be coming into grief, how, what encouraging words can you leave with them? Well, one thing is, is to surround yourself with support. Anyone who's supportive, surround yourself with them. Um, join support groups on social media that has sincerely helped me and unfortunately for me I also had uh, my cousin's wife her and I had started a relationship we are really really close now because two weeks after I had Sarai she delivered their child um, their son um, I call him Ann but it's Edward Manuel, and unfortunately, 
less than 25 days later, he passed away. Um, so both of us were in loss and we're in this together. And to have someone else in this unfortunate situation, but to have someone else that you can lean on that actually does understand what you're going through. Um, Jessica and I, we text, we talk. She gets me into grief support groups on Zoom and everything like that. And um, I couldn't have gotten through this year also without her. I couldn't have gotten through it. And as much as Sarai was mine, she was hers as well. And as much as Eddie Manuel is their child, also my angel as well. And I did on um, my due date in May, uh, my due date was May 13th. So what I did was I released balloons um, with the children, but I did re release a balloon for um, Eddie Manuel. And when I released his balloon and the balloon for my daughter together separately, but they came together, which was the weirdest thing. And I'd like to know that they are together. So just, I like to think that all of our babies are together. And Stephanie Crawford, um, the founder of Prophecy, she said, not everybody, uh, she said, not everybody gets to create their own angel their own guardian angel and we have them. That's who our angels are. There are guardian angels. And if you're, if you've lost your faith, definitely get back into that because God didn't leave us or forsaken us. It may feel like it, um, you may get angry and just hurt, but God will get you through this. and. Therapy helped me tre tremendously. I wouldn't have done it without um, Lakeisha, my therapist. I would not have gotten through it without her. And um, and again, family, friends, your supporters. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have gotten through 2020 without everybody, my kids, everybody. Thank you so much. Shirley, for sharing your story and your light. I know it's going to be a blessing to those who listen. Where can our listeners connect with you after this? I am on Instagram as red underscore golden underscore essence. You can find me there. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Shirley. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. Um, wishing you and your family a successful 2021. Thank and you. we'll be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. There are so many ways to connect with the Sisters in Loss community. Join our monthly support group, our Sisters in Loss Healing Collective at sistersinlosshealing.com. Join our free Facebook group at sistersinloss.com forward slash community or text sisters to 797979 to download your free journal to healing ebook that is sisters to 797979 to download your free journal to healing ebook follow us on instagram and facebook at sisters in loss and subscribe to our youtube channel yeah girl we on youtube at sisters in loss TV. We love you for listening. Keep the faith. Until next time, this is Erica and I'll talk to you soon.